If you take a nucleus and break it apart into its constituent particles like neutrons and protons, then you'd probably expect that the mass of the nucleus should be equal to the mass of all its constituent particles. But that's not what happens. To illustrate this point, let's take a very specific example. So here I have taken the example of a deuterium atom. So the deuterium atom is basically an isotope of hydrogen. So hydrogen basically has one proton and one electron, but deuterium has an extra neutron inside it. So basically it has a one proton and one neutron in the nucleus and one electron in its atomic shells. The mass of a deuterium atom comes out to be around 2.014102 atomic units. Now if by some manner I can break apart the deuterium atom atom into a proton, neutron and electron, you would probably expect that the sum of the masses of all these constituent particles should be equal to the mass of the deuterium atom itself. But that's not exactly what happens. If you take the mass of hydrogen atom, which is basically one proton and one electron, it, the mass comes out to be 1.007825 atomic units. And if you take the mass of a free uh, neutron particle, the mass comes out to be 1.008665 uh, atomic units. If you add both of these two values, the total mass comes out to be 2.016490 atomic units, which is not the same as this value. The mass of the deuterium atom is 2.014102 while the mass of the sum of its constituent comes out to be 2.016490. What is happening? Where is this extra mass coming from? In fact, this expected mass, which we get from summing up the constituent particles and the actual mass is different from each other. And this difference is known as mass defect. So mass defect basically is the difference in the masses of the actual nucleus and the summation of all its constituent particles. Where is this coming from? One possible explanation could be that when the deuterium atom was formed in the first place from its constituent particles, some amount of energy was released in the process. And this mass defect basically corresponds to that particular energy. Now, how can we relate energy with mass? Well, the relationship between energy and mass is given by the famous Einstein's mass energy equivalence formula, which is E is equal to mc square. So if there is some kind of a mass uh, uh, having mass m, then there is associated energy is basically given by E is equal to mc square. Since we are dealing with uh, units of atomic mass units and we can convert the uh, SI units from kg and meter per second to that of atomic mass unit and for one atomic mass unit the corresponding energy comes out to be around 931.49 mega electron volt so one possible explanation could be that this mass defect has an energy associated with it and if i multiply 931.49 with this amount of mass defect then the total amount of energy comes out to be 2.224 mega electron volt so as i just now told you that one possible explanation for this kind of a mass defect could be that if i break apart this deuterium into its constant student particles, then I require this amount of energy to do so. So basically, I need to do some kind of work against all the nuclear forces, which is holding the nucleus together to break it apart into free particles. And in doing so, I need this amount of energy to break the deuterium nucleus into its constituent particles of a free proton and a free neutron. Or I can also say that when initially this deuterium nucleus was formed, then this is the amount of energy which was released in uh, that particular process. To test that hypothesis, what we can do is we can bombard a deuterium nucleus with some kind of a gamma photon having energy of 2.224 mega electron volt. If the gamma photon has an energy less than 2.224 mega electron volt, which is basically corresponding to the energy corresponding to the mass defect, if the energy is less, nothing is going to happen, the deuterium atom is going to stay the same. However, if the energy is equal to 2.224 mega electron volt, then the deuterium atom will break apart into a hydrogen atom and a free neutron. If the energy is greater than this, then the excess energy will be given off as kinetic energy of the sort of daughter particles. So this brings us to the concept of binding energy. What is a binding energy? So binding energy is basically associated with a bound system. So if there's a bound system or an aggregate or a collection of particles, in that case, then certain amount of energy is always required to break apart that bound system or break apart the collection of particles into its constituent particles because we need to do some kind of a work against the nuclear forces that are holding the nucleus together. So the amount of energy that 
I need to provide to break apart an assembly of nuclear particles from a nucleus and do some work against the nuclear forces is the amount of energy which is known as binding energy. And this binding energy is basically manifested when the nucleus was formed in the first place. So when these free particles came together and forms a nucleus, in that case, amount of energy corresponding to the mass defect is released in the universe and therefore the total amount of mass of a bound system or an aggregate which is the effective nucleus is basically less than the summation of the mass of all these individual particles themselves. This gives us basically a way of calculating the binding energy of any kind of a given nucleus. So for any kind of a general nucleus which has let's suppose z number of protons, z number of electrons and uh, a mass number so basically a minus z number of neutrons. In that case the binding energy can simply be calculated by looking at the mass of these individual protons and neutrons and the mass of the entire nucleus itself. So to do that we can simply multiply the mass of a hydrogen atom because a hydrogen atom would include the electrons as well. So the mass of the hydrogen atom with the atomic number because that is the number of protons the nucleus has and we can also multiply the mass of a neutron with the number of neutrons which is a minus z. And then I, we can subtract it from the mass of the nucleus itself and multiply it with 931.49 mega electron volts. This will basically give us a way of calculating the binding energy of any general nuclear system. I have done that for the case of a couple of examples. So for alpha particle, the binding energy comes out to be 28.3 mega electron volts. For oxygen, it comes out to be 127.6 mega electron volts. For the case of bismuth, it comes out to be 1640 mega electron volt. As you can see, with increasing mass number, as nucleus becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, bigger you will require more and more amount of binding energy to hold the nucleus together. So obviously uh, these values cannot be compared with respect to each other because they are increasing with uh, the amount of mass number of the nucleus. To compare to make a comparison between different kinds of nuclei and uh, to get an idea about the stability of different kinds of nuclei what we in look into is basically the binding energy per nucleon. As it turns out is that the binding energy has a sort of an approximately proportional relationship with that of the mass number. So if I divide the binding energy with the mass number in that case we come up with a number which can be compared for different kinds of elements. So for the case of a deuterium as we already saw it is a very very small binding energy per nucleon which is 1.112 but for the other cases for bigger nuclei for example alpha particle the binding energy per nucleon comes out to be 7.07 .07. for oxygen the binding energy per nucleon comes out to be 7.98 for bismuth the binding energy per nucleon comes out to be 7.8 so in all of these cases I've divided the binding energy with their respective mass number so as you can see the ma binding energy per nucleon is compar comparable uh, for all of these different kinds of elements if we create a graph with increasing mass number we look at the binding energy per nucleon for all the chemical elements present basically I'm talking about the nucleus here in that case that kind of a graph is known as binding energy graph or binding energy curve. So when you plot all of the binding energy per nucleon for the entire periodic table then you will get a graph that looks like this. This is the binding energy curve. So in the y-axis you have the binding energy per nucleon and in the x-axis you have increasing mass number. So for extremely small mass numbers like the case of a deuterium that we took the uh, binding energy per nucleon is very less. Uh, it's around 1.1 mega electron volt but uh, around mass number 4 it suddenly rises and you see a peak for an alpha particle here which comes out to be around 7 mega electron volts. Beyond that for mass numbers less than 30 you see a certain kind of recurring peaks here. These recurring peaks basically correspond to some very stable nuclei such as uh, alpha particle, beryllium, carbon, oxygen and neon. So these are the nuclei which basically have uh, mass numbers that are multiples of four and they contain equal number of protons and neutrons. Because they are multiples of four and they contain equal number of protons and neutrons, they turn out to be exceedingly stable and have higher binding energy per nucleon compared to their nearest neighbors. With increasing mass number, the binding energy slowly keeps on rising and it reaches a maximum around the mass number of 56 and from then on it slowly starts decreasing. So as you can see, the binding energy per nucleon for extremely small nuclei is quite less. The binding energy per nucleon for mid-range nuclei is quite high and the binding energy per nucleon for large, extremely large nuclei is less. 
Now, what can binding energy per nucleon tell us about some of the properties of the nucleus? So, one very important thing that we can understand from binding energy per nucleon is stability. So, basically, binding energy is the amount of energy that is required to break apart a nucleus into its constituent particles. If the binding energy is going to be less, that means we will require less energy to break apart a nucleus into its constituent particles. If the binding energy is going to be greater, that means we will require more and more amount of energy to break apart a nucleus into its constituent particles. That means if the binding energy of a nucleus is higher, it will be much much more difficult to break apart that nucleus into its constituent particles. So we can say that that nucleus is much much more stable. So that way we can get an idea about the stability of any kind of a given nucleus. So a higher binding energy per nucleon basically corresponds to higher stability of the nucleus. Those nuclei which has extremely high binding energies compared to other nuclei are extremely stable. A low binding energy basically corresponds to lower stability. This can also give us an idea about the kinds of nuclear transformation processes that happens in nature or the kind of nuclear transformation processes that can lead to either absorption or emission of energy. So for example, if some kind of a nuclear reaction takes place in which uh, two or more nuclei come together and they have less binding energy per nucleon, but they end up forming a uh, daughter nuclei which has extremely high binding energy per nucleon that in that case where binding energy is increasing along the nuclear transformation then that process would lead to emission of energy and this energy which is released would basically be equal to the difference in the binding energy between the final product and the initial product if the opposite scenario is happening if a high binding energy per nucleon nuclei is disintegrating into other particles having lesser binding en uh, energy then in that case would require absorption of energy in that process so binding energy basically gives us an idea about the direction in which energy is going to be released in a given nuclear reaction. When the binding energy increases along a nuclear reaction, then energy is emitted in that particular process. Using this knowledge, we can basically get an idea about what kind of nuclear transformation reactions would lead to emission of energy in this kind of a graph. I can divide the entire graph along the middle around the region of A is equal to 56 and I can say that if some kind of a nuclear reaction happens in this region, in the first region where let's suppose a small nuclei combines with another small nuclei to form some kind of a, a little bit of a bigger but mid-range nuclear structure. If this kind of a reaction happens where extremely small nuclei combine together to form a little bit larger nuclei, then as you can see the binding energy keeps on increasing in this process. The binding energy of the final product would be greater than the binding energy of the initial reactants. This kind of a process would lead to emission of huge amounts of energy and this kind of a reaction is known as nuclear fusion. In nuclear fusion small nuclei like hydrogen combine to form a little bit bigger nuclei like helium and other isotopes of helium. This process leads to the emission of a huge amount of energy. The reverse can also happen in the other end of the graph here. So if I have some kind of a really large nucleus like a uranium or something like that and if this large nucleus breaks apart into two smaller uh, nuclei. In this case, what is going to happen is that, as you can see here along this graph, the large nucleus has lesser binding energy compared to the smaller nuclear structure. So if this kind of a nuclear transformation happens where a big nucleus breaks apart into smaller configurations, then this will also lead to emission of energy and this kind of a process is known as nuclear fission. In nuclear fission a big nuclei basically which is unstable or rather which has lesser binding energy can break apart into smaller smaller nuclei which have higher binding energy and this leads to the emission of a huge amount of energy. So to summarize the binding energy is basically the amount of energy that we require to break apart a nucleus into its constituent particles. The higher the binding energy of a nucleus the greater is the stability of the nucleus. And if in any given nuclear reaction if the binding energy of the uh, constituent particles increases then that would lead to an emission of energy in the given nuclear reaction. That's it for today's video. See you in the next one.